Good evening, everyone. Tonight, what we're going to uh, look at, we're going to do a quick review of the readily available laboratory tests that we do every single day for liver disease, uh, focusing almost exclusively, despite some of our, our cat doctor's objections, on canine liver disease. Uh, go through the imaging options that most of us have pretty ready access to. Uh, actually, all of us. Um, we're not going to be talking about MR or CT or anything. Uh, for hepatobiliary disease, spend some time talking about sampling techniques that are available and then review some select hepatopathies or liver conditions that we see in dogs, the ones I see most frequently and the ones we probably need to work the most on. Before we get started, I want to give this man some credit. This is Dr. Dave Tweet from Colorado State. We all have gurus in our life. Uh, I, I never had a liver guru. Uh, I had renal gurus, heart gurus uh, in my training and, and afterwards. Uh, he's actually the guru of my colleague for many years in Memphis, Dr. Danielle Bayless. So she came to Memphis in 2007 while I was still there and talked about Dr. Tweet. So I started paying attention to his work and his readings. So um, a lot of the ways I do treat and diagnose liver disease are actually based on indirect teachings through my former colleague, Dr. Bayless. So that's Dr. Dave Tweet, uh, liver, one of the world's most renowned liver specialists at, from Colorado State. I know we're all excited about clinical pathology, so we won't spend a lot of time going through this, but we're just going to review what our basic enzymes and other lab values that we look at for liver disease, where they come from, what they mean, and as we will refer back to this later in the talk as we talk about specific liver conditions and when or if we need to get concerned in both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. So we, uh, we'll talk first about ALT or AST. These we consider are leakage enzymes. Uh, they are, the, the normal hepatocyte is rich, uh, it's stocked with ALT as well as AST. So if we get elevated levels of, this, of these enzymes, especially the ALT, it indicates that there's been hepatocellular membrane damage or damage to the hepatocyte causing that enzyme to leak. Uh, roughly, not, not perfectly in all cases, but roughly the magnitude of increase reflects the number of affected hepatocytes. So those dogs that have toxic hepatopathies where you get ALTs in the ten, you know, greater than 10,000, you can assume that the majority of the liver is affected and, and less so with less uh, elevated counts. Uh, Half-life uh, is, is pretty long, about two and a half days uh, in the dog. And so that's why it can take days to weeks to decline after an acute insult. So uh, I don't worry about the, the, the rapidity of the ALT decrease, just that it does go down with time uh, as we're monitoring treatment. We all have our moments when we, or how we go about deciding when to really worry about ALT. But in general, I think that a two times greater normal, so depending on your lab, 150, some labs as high as uh, 180, but usually around 125, 150, so 300 or above, or if we see persistence of the ALT, or certainly ALT for me, as it increases over time, regardless of the starting value, uh, are where we need to get concerned. But does a single ALT of 165 warrant all of the test? Um, to be determined and, and to be argued. But if we see a persistent increase over time, or if we're starting out in the three to 400 range or above, uh, our anxiety about that finding probably needs to be uh, real. Now, AST, I will admit right now that I, think, I, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to AST. I think of it as a kissing cousin to ALT, uh, since they both live in uh, similar areas of the hepatocyte. Uh, I, I basically ignore it if it's on our panels. It's not on most of our general panels we get next door. Uh, but it is a little more sensitive for liver disease when they're both elevated because of its mitochondrial location. So when there's damage to the mitochondria, you will get higher AST elevations. But I'll admit, unless I'm worried about muscle disease, I don't get too fired up about AST all by itself. Or uh, I'll pay much, attention, much more attention to its more handsome cousin, ALT. Again, less specific because we do see it in other muscles, uh, other tissues, especially the muscle. And, and it has a much shorter half-life, so that's where it is more sensitive in that if you have a high AST uh, with an ALT, you can say that you probably have significant liver disease because it has a much shorter half-life, uh, whereas the um, AST will, or ALT will stick around for days. So if you use it as, as one of your indicators of potential liver disease in combination with an ALT, they're both elevated, you know you probably had a pretty recent or relatively significant persistent uh, hepatic injury.
Lots of small words here. Um, cholestasis, and this is where we'll spend a lot of time. Uh, ALP, it, it's a bit of a friend enemy of mine. It's, uh, a lot of times we, we just don't know how, how excited to get about it, so we'll, we'll focus on that. And then, of course, it's semi-kissing cousin GGT. So unlike ALT and AST that are, that are loaded in most hepatocytes, there actually is very little alkaline phosphatase in a normal hepatocyte. They, these enzymes come up to either one of two ways, impaired bile flow or drug induction. So these enzymes are induced due to either of those main two major causes, it decreased bile flow or drug induction, which we're all very familiar with, especially in, in the world of corticosteroids. We throw out cholestasis a lot, term, term we always say, cholestatic enzymes. So it's, it's always good to remind ourselves what is cholestasis. And it's just decrease in bile flow to, due to impaired secretion by hepatocytes or to obstruction through the intra and, hepatic, intra and extra hepatic bile ducts. So it's either not being secreted due to hepatocellular injury or insufficiency, or we're having some form of obstruction through the intra and hepatic bile ducts. So again, substances that are normally screened into bowel are retained and uh, increase into the serum. So any condition that increases the surface tension in the canaliculi, we won't spend any time going through the anatomy of the hepatocyte or the liver itself uh, and bowel ductules results in upregulation. So again, ALP, there's not a lot of it in a normal hepatocyte, it has to be induced by either reduced bile flow or induction. So of course we all know many of the drugs that are involved with the induction, steroids, 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 some anticonvulsants, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, anticonvulsants, but alkphos only, GGT is not induced by anticonvulsants and possibly other drugs or supplements, and perhaps even dietary um, components. So plasma half-life for dogs, extremely long. We know of dogs that sit on an alkphos of 500 to 1,000 to 2,000 for years. Uh, whereas in cats, here's your cat mention, uh, ALP in dogs, I will say 90% of the time, eh, whatever, uh, give me an ALT and we'll talk. Uh, but alkphos stays around forever. But cats, especially a real fat cat that's not eating alkphos elevation, we're getting excited. And we're pulling out little red rubber tubes and um, putting it somewhere in its neck, hopefully in the esophagus. Um, so, of course, there are other sources of alkaline phosphatase, so we won't spend much time on that. But bone sources, we all know that puppies uh, will have an increased ALP from bone origin alkaline phosphatase prior to epiphyseal uh, plate closure, or in dogs with bone neoplasia or lytic lesions. I, I can't say that the rare cases that I see, rather than Dr. Vansel, I don't go looking for alkaline phosphatase, but um, you can with special labs determine those, but uh, I don't spend any time on that. In comparison, GGT is mostly from the epithelial cells and the biliary ducts. So elevations tend to reflect hepatobiliary tract disease. So this is one case where Alphos does what it wants for all sorts of conditions. GGT, uh, with exception of, of corticosteroid induction, if it's persistently and consistently elevated, you probably are mostly dealing, if not exclusively, with primary hepatobiliary tract disease, such as duct, duct obstruction, clenched hepatitis, or neoplasia. And so higher specificity, you can rule it out, rule it in, rule in liver disease with a high GGT better than you can rule it out uh, than alkaline phosphatase. But again, I just consider it the less handsome cousin of alkaline phosphatase. Don't spend a lot of time on it myself. They usually go up in, in, in unison, but it's there. So again, if we put, if we put them together, if, you, if they're on most of your panels, alkaline phosphatase and GGT, your specificity or your ability to rule in liver disease almost approaches 100%. So those two together you have a very high chance of it being primary liver. Uh, bone does not contain GGT, so this poor will just assume it's uh, probably uh, a Dane or a Boxer or other poor cancer-stricken dog uh, with man or osteosarcoma. I don't do bones. I'm pretty sure that's the distal radius. Um, that, that bone tumor uh, should not have an elevated GGT unless it has concurrent liver disease. That is the radius, right? Am I right? It's radius ulna. Okay. Very good. Um, and so anticonvulsants do not. So primadone, phenobarbital, you should not see. They, they do not, does not get induced. GGT does not. So if you have elevated GGT activity with alkaline phosphatase on a phenobarbital dog, it's not from the drug. You, you have to worry about primary or potentially acquired liver disease. 
So we remember getting this question as a third or fourth year vet student. What uh, values on a routine chemistry panel can we use to determine liver function or, or sufficiency, uh, functional uh, sufficiency of the liver? Big one. And uh, as I've worked this last year or so with Dr. Long in critical care, Albumin is probably the, if you've just had to pick the most important value on a chemistry panel, it's probably the albumin, because all of the studies she makes us read for rounds, um, low albumin, if you have low albumin, everything sucks, because uh, all studies show that if you don't have a high albumin, something's going wrong. So, of course, it's made exclusively in the liver for amino acids in the diet, but we, we think it probably takes about 60% of hepatic dysfunction for serum concentrations to decline. So, I would say majority of our dogs that, that come in for hypoalbuminemia, especially our little teacup Yorkies and, and other dogs like that, until proven otherwise, I'm going GI, if they have any GI signs. So, you guys, uh, protein losing enteropathy for me is by far the most common presentation we see. You will see some breeds um, with, with renal loss and then a third distant for hypobuminemia is the liver. But fortunately we'll be discussing all the other function tests we have available to help determine that. Uh, the other ones that we remember getting quizzed on our first week in fourth year vet student internal medicine, uh, blood glucose, uh, bilirubin, BUN, urea, and cholesterol all uh, formed in the liver. And then of course the clotting factor except for factor 8, which is also produced by endothelial cells elsewhere. So when looking for indirect indicators of liver function, these, we all recall, are our main items we're looking at. What do we have uh, readily available to look at liver function? And we all know the bile acid. And uh, if you read Dr. Tweet's work, uh, we're probably not running enough of these because it is the most sensitive test available to, um, to detect hepatobiliary level of hepatobiliary function in our dogs. It uh, starts out, as so many uh, hormones and other substances do, as cholesterol. Uh, and then in the liver, it's conjugated and then excreted into the bile transported to the gallbladder where it hangs around until we eat and uh, then excreted into the intestine uh, through the uh, common bile duct uh, into the proximal duodenum where it's primarily used for fat emulsification. Uh, this is where it's neat what bile does un unlike so many other things in life like the government it's very efficient uh, every bile molecule that's excreted 95 to 98 percent gets recirculated by the enterohepatic circulation so the vast majority of what's produced just keeps getting used unlike so much else in life. So we're going to spend about the next 45 minutes going over this slide, all the enzymatic steps of uh, or, or the next 30 seconds. Uh, I just was Googling uh, pictures for this and came up, and I, I think this is a fellow's bum. And I, 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 you know, so just to show us the 5%, I guess these are bacteria in the stool. I just was very entertained by this picture. So j just to remind us that as it's excreted into the bile, into the gallbladder, released into, uh, I don't actually have an intestinal tract here, but released into the duodenum and then reabsorbed in the distal ileum uh, with the exception of the poor five, 2 to 5% that actually get excreted into the stool. So if you want to uh, go over all this in detail, Dr. Wong is still here. And uh, you can go talk to her. She'll, she'll go through this slide. And she probably knows what all that stuff means. So, bile acids continue. And, and this is where, when we read Dr. Tweet's work, I, I, I'm not running enough of these. Uh, we tend to get dogs that come in for elevated liver values and go straight to ultrasound. Uh, we're probably not doing bile acids because... It, we know that it has such a value is, and include just a fasting bile acid. You know, we are all trained with the little shunt dogs to do the pre and post prandial, but a fasting bile acid, uh, based on studies, um, it really gives us more information than we probably know. So again, a fasting bile acid reflection of the efficiency and integrity of the enterohepatic circulation. So that amazing slide we just looked at, uh, a fasting bile acid allows us to determine how efficient and, and integral or how, how well it's working on the various levels here that again Dr. Wong can go over with you whenever you want to go talk to her. When we're looking at bile acids, we're looking for hepatobiliary or portal circulation pathology. So either in the liver, in the extraction of bile acids from the liver into the bile duct, or the enterohepatic circulation coming back in through the portal vasculature to return to the liver as part of the enterohepatic. Those are the two areas where when we're talking about inefficiency of the liver, it's either of the conjugation extraction in the liver or issues, i.e. our shunt dogs, of the return of the bowel uh, through the portal circulation back to the liver before it reaches the um, systemic uh, circulation. 
So again, so that's what, what we're looking at. And, and always remember, and always seeing at least one new intern a year, we use bile acids prior to the development of hyperbilirubinemia. So when you have an icteric dog, you've lost your chance to get any utility out of the bile acid because the bile acids are going to increase in inefficient livers prior to the onset of jaundice. When, you're, when you've hit jaundice from primary, uh, either primary intrahepatic, post-hepatic um, jaundice, we're not, we're not talking about pre-hepatic, but intrahepatic, post-hepatic jaundice, your bile acids are going to be elevated and you've lost your window to, to, find, to, to, use, to use them. They're, they're not, they're, they've lost all usefulness once the dog is jaundiced from its liver disease, which is okay, just don't run it. It's a waste of money at that time. But as good as a bile acid test is, it's not specific to any particular pathological process, shunt, cholangitis, you name it, and nor, nor is the degree of elevation specific for any process. So that makes me cringe a little bit when this dog comes in for a shunt, um, and it's not a shunt, it probably does have a shunt, um, but because uh, you know, people want an ultrasound, because the probe is this big, the dog's that big. Um, so when do we use bile, when should we use these, this is a screening test. So any dog with abnormal liver enzymes, non-jaundiced, is where we should probably be doing at least a fasting bile acid. And we'll go into what the values mean in just a second. And, and including the ones where we suspect there may be a loss of hepatic function. So you have the dog that's just not doing well, Vague signs, a little lethargy, loss of appetite, no diarrhea, no vomiting, renal values are normal, but you have a slightly low glucose, slightly low cholesterol, slightly low albumin, and you can't find another place, that's where your fasting bile acid is going to be very helpful uh, to help you determine hepatic function prior to doing intestinal biopsy or potentially, or you know, if you want to do a protein creatinine ratio in the urine. Obviously, we need them for this thing. This uh, little dog here, uh, if we're looking for uh, PSS or portal vein hyperplasia, microvascular dysplasia. And so, from the teachings of King Tweet, 25 on a fasting value with concurrent elevated liver enzymes, uh, studies have shown a very high probability that you biopsy that liver, you have a significant histologic lesion. Now, we're all trained, and when I've, all the years I've thought of bile acids, I'm thinking of this, this dog's probably called Chloe or Bitsy or some fairy name, um, that's what we're thinking about using it. But if we want to, if we're having that, if we're on the fence, is it time to do a liver biopsy or even consider it, you have this chronic high ALT or whatever, get your fasting bile acid. Greater than 25, high probability. Less than 14, 14.9, or I believe is what IDEX uses, is, is going to be normal, 14, 14 to 25. They consider that the gray zone. But greater than 25 with a dog that you're worried about having primary liver, um, liver disease, that's your value that you're going to hang on to. So again, gray zone, and we get those, those dogs in that 14 to 25 range, that's where we do the postprandial bile acid. You know, give them a meal, typically a small a couple of teaspoon, tablespoons of a high-fat food, and check again in two hours. That's where we want to do it because obviously then we can use the elevation of that second value to help us determine uh, how, how aggressively we need to move forward with our diagnostics. And the diagnostic value increases for hepatic disease uh, as well as congenital vascular anomal anomalies. So in the teachings of King Tweet, greater than 25, you're probably ready to biopsy. Gray zone, do your postprandial. If you get higher than 25, that's where you're going. We'll talk a little bit more about shunt dogs in just a second when we talk about another test. Probably have some dogs that have a normal value above 25, but they could also have uh, portal vein hypoplasia, microvascular dysplasia. So I will say, let's see what's next. So uh, you know, there, there's some controversy. You know, we will get these dogs that, that have a postprandial value, this Yorkie named Pixie or something, uh, with a post value of 36, and the pre is 13. You so say you're 13 and 36, probably not a shunt. In general, uh, I think of shunt dogs, the classic mic macrovascular large shunt having a postprandial value greater than 100, but it doesn't have to be the case. And that's where uh, sometimes we want to pull our hair out. So we won't spend a lot of time on this, but we've all done the bile acid assay, and, and the pre is 29 and the post is 3. That doesn't make sense. Uh, we've all heard about the, did, did the, was there a preprandial gallbladder contraction? We don't know. There are a number of other reasons. Uh, some dogs store various amounts of newly produced bile in the gallbladder. A meal can, stim in some cases, only stimulate release of 5 to 65 uh, percent. Again, these are mostly all research studies. Um, humans, mice, and, and some dogs. And then also we can have, we, we talked about that enterohepatic circulation. Sometimes we can't 
or we shouldn't ignore when we get these discordant results that perhaps there's an issue with, with the lower aspect of the enteropathic circulation. Could there be GI issues where we're not getting it? But I, the way I look at it, if I get these discordant values with a high pre and a low or normal post, you don't get your feelings hurt. It just happens. Uh, and don't try to explain it. You'll hurt your, it hurts my head to think that much. So, what about anyone in here run urinary bile acids? Something you do? I mean, they're readily available. I have never run one in uh, the last 15 years of, of practice. Uh, but they are available. You can get them right next door, right, right out in the hallway. Exact same information. I honestly don't even know the, the values and how they compare the normals to serum bile acids. But most studies have shown they're, they're pretty much the same, similar diagnostic utility. So one way that's proposed to use the urinary bile acids, if you have a litter of pixies or whatever, little toy dogs, and you just want to screen the litter without having to put them all through pre, pre and post prandial, if you get a bunch of high um, urinary bile acids, you might, might warrant doing additional testing. But but uh, I, I'll be honest, that's a test I do not routinely run. Any new graduates, they still doing ammonia in the universities? Maybe still running them up the, some of us older graduates we might remember where we'd do an uh, ammonia tolerance test or a baseline ammonia where you get the blood sample, you put it on ice, run it up to the clean path and get the dirty looks from the clean path. Uh, um, we, we all know those people, the, the angry clean path workers. Uh, it's a great test. It's got a you know, wonderful utility uh, with uh, hepatic encephalopathy or significant hepatic dysfunction, greater than 70%, as we'll see with our shunt dogs or with significant acquired liver disease. Um, ammonia is it's from the GI tract and it gets detoxified in the liver to urea for ready, ready, ready excretion through the kidneys. It's a great test, great sensitivity specificity for detection of portosystemic shunning, but it's a pain to run. And we, to my knowledge, there are no in-house machines and even if there are... Yes? You have you have them in hospital. Do you like the? Because I know there are bedside. Um, good. How is it? Just just serum sample and put it right in there. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. So uh, we probably need to do more. I uh, so think they have them next door, but I've never even asked because uh, this is the first time I've lived next door to a reference lab. Memphis, we'd have to ship it to about. 30 minutes into South Memphis where nobody wants to go. And um, so I, no, we couldn't get them there quick enough, so I've got way out of practice for running them. But I have read about the, the cage side or bedside test, and so I'm good, yeah. yeah. And so uh, I, I don't know if anyone's looked at those and comparing them to the big reference labs, but good to have. So, I mean, good, and, and I know you can do bile acids in-house. I don't know much data about that, but uh, so good. So we probably need to do more of those if we feel that it's a, it's a good, reliable in-house test. But again, historically, uh, for those of us who aren't, don't have ready access to the ClinPath lab, it, it's a real pain in the behind. So here's a test that uh, anyone familiar with Protein C? I mean, you're probably familiar with it as a, if you like to run a bunch of um, coag panels. Uh, this is a test that uh, Dr. Wong was a big fan of, and I've become a big fan because it, it gets me out of trying to do a shunt hunt ultrasound on the little pixie dogs. So for those of you who remember, uh, Protein C, anticoagulant protein, important in maintenance of hemostatic balance and to protect against thromboembolism. Sounds like a good definition. Uh, vitamin K dependent. Uh, anticoagulant protein, but here's where it's important, synthesized in the liver. And based on a study, I think from about 2006 up at Cornell, which is the lab we used to run a protein C, Dr. Tulza, with his uh, uh, mentor, Dr. Sharon Center, she of the uh, crazy liver lady, proposed that it could be a good biomarker of hepatic function. Our client cost, including the overnight shipping to the Cornell labs, about 150, whereas an ultrasound is around 400. And so this next slide will show us where this test may have clinical utility and where we use it quite frequently. So from this study, from I think around 2006, indicated that protein C activity is significantly lower in dogs with congenital, and that of course with the majority of the dogs, with the large macrovascular portosystemic shunts, compared to uh, dogs that did not have portosystemic shunting. So from this study, it is strongly believed by the liver guru types that it reflects the adequacy of hepatic portal perfusion. And again, we're talking about liver efficiency as, as the... Uh, as the bile and other substances are brought back through the portal vein into the liver. They found in this study that protein C activity at 70 is the cutoff 
in dogs with microvascular dysplasia or portal vein hypoplasia, whatever you want to call it, or dogs without liver disease, that they all had a protein C activity greater than 70%. Whereas almost 9 out of 10 dogs with known portosystemic shunts were less than 70%. So where Dr. Wong and I use protein C's somewhat frequently are the little pixie dogs that come in and they, now we have the dog, pixie comes in with a pre, again most of, the vast majority if not all of these dogs have had pre and post prandial bile acids and we're talking the pre is 70 and the post is 319. There's not a lot of debate there. The, the, that dog has a shunt or it has a dead liver for some reason. But little Pixie with the bows and the mom who has little Yorkie earrings, that dog has a shunt. We don't need it for that dog. We can do the shunt hunt or, or find Dr. Munsell wherever her traveling band of radiology folks are going and get her to do a bubble study or... I, I haven't asked my surgeons here to do angiography or, or portography, I should say. Uh, that, that's not the one we're worried about. It's the little, say, year and a half old, um, year and a half old small breed dog that came in for a dental or came in, or you know, six months to a year and a half, came in for a spay or neuter. And we have an ALT of 200. And you do the right thing. After we talk tonight, you say, this dog has an ALT of 200, alk fossil 160, I'm going to do bile acids. And you get the 13 and the 29. 13 in the 36. So elevated. You have hepatic insufficiency. Pixie or whoever the dog is gets sent to me for your ultrasound. I cringe. Uh, instead of asking that owner, knowing that ultrasounding that dog that size for $400 is going to be a challenge and only has about, depending on the study, a 65 to, to maybe 80% chance of picking up a shunt if it's there, let's do this test and use that cutoff. Use that cutoff of 70, and you get that protein C back usually next day or two day with overnight shipping. It comes back at 79 percent, 81 percent. We don't have to do the we don't have to do the ultrasound. We don't have to do a shunt hunt because we know from this study, Sharon Center, she's crazy cat woman up in or crazy liver woman up in uh, upstate New York, shown quite consistently that th that's the cutoff we need. Now occasionally we'll get some that are 71, 72, and but but fortunately most of these where I'm quite confident it's not a classic large portosystemic shunt, we get those values in the 70s and 80s. Then we can feel really good that we don't have to spend the money on the ultrasound, don't have to track down Dr. Munsell, or heaven forbid, send someone down to see one of the radiologists at Blue Pearl to get more advanced imaging for the shunt. So that's where we use that test somewhat frequently here when we have these, especially young, small breed dogs, many times asymptomatic, where we're is it shunt? Is it not? Does that all make sense? So if you see us submitting a protein C, that's the uh, reasoning behind that. So, spend a little bit of time on imaging. Uh, again, I, I think we underutilize uh, radiographs for, um, for, for the liver because you just can't measure. You can, now, when you put the probe here on a dog, uh, right in the mid-abdomen, and you see liver, that's a big liver. But for more subtle changes, uh, like we see here, that's a pretty normal lever. Gastric axis is lining up quite well uh, with the ribs, so that, that's a normal lever. But when, and that's spleen, but if we have liver going out here, which I think we have on this next slide, that's a patamegaly. I, I could probably see that with ultrasound, but you just can't beat that. You know that gastric axis is about heading with the uh, descending colon. Uh, I do think it's underutilized. It's an easy test, and if you're worried about liver, uh, and a lot of times you can pick up a mass effect. So when you're trying to determine if you want to send these people off to, uh, or send clients off to get an ultrasound or do an ultrasound yourself, uh, you know, this dog probably needs an ultrasound. You want to look at the parenchym of that liver. But again, nothing beats an x-ray for looking, a routine lateral x-ray radiograph to look at size of the liver. So also on some of these shunt dogs where they don't want to do a protein C, I'm or shunt suspects, bile acid postprandial is 28. I'll just take a radiograph and you get this, you know, that much liver, that, that, this dog doesn't have a shunt. You can feel pretty good about it because we know that most shunts have pretty significant micropatia. So um, lateral film for me is extremely valuable, 50, 70 bucks, however much you, you charge for one lateral x-ray. Uh, it can save some dogs, like this dog here, if you think it has a shunt, you're, you're going to save a lot of money on ultrasound and other diagnostics. So, obviously here we have marked patamegaly. Uh, until proven otherwise, I think we need to look at the adrenals on that dog. Here you go. Uh, here, here's the dog with the, uh, you know, I think we can all identify the large hepatic mass there. Uh, this dog... I don't even, although I feed my children with ultrasound, I don't know that this dog needs an ultrasound unless you want to look for, for masses elsewhere. This dog, if mom and dad are up for it, probably just needs to go on ahead and see if we can get that bad boy out because it's not going to be happy there very long.
been, been talking about ultrasound. Uh, most of us uh, have, have pretty ready access to ultrasound, uh, which is, and, you know, liver is easy to see. It's right there uh, in the cranial quadrants. So uh, I do think, uh, and obviously we spend a lot of time here, so ultrasound, a lot of livers on a daily basis. Uh, it has utility in defining or determining parenchymal changes, mass lesions, as well as disorders of the biliary system, but not accurate in differentiation of the major parenchymal changes. So, uh, yeah, very frequent presenting complaint here, uh, mild to moderate liver enzyme elevations, asymptomatic dog, uh, Alkfoss 600, ALT 200. And the owners come here either because uh, the veterinarian does not want to do the dental, doesn't want to do the lump removal. We want to look at the liver. I tell folks the vast majority of these dogs, especially the asymptomatic ones, I probably won't see much. Uh, and I don't want to, because we don't want to find a tumor. We don't want to find biliary obstruction. We don't want to find a gallbladder mucosal. But before, you know, if we have, or especially for these dogs that have persistent enzyme elevations, whether or not they're symptomatic, I tell these folks, if we do nothing else, we're going to try and leave with some peace of mind, that we do not have a large mass lesion, that we do not have a gallbladder that's sitting there as a mucosal ready to pop, or that we see some other severe parenchymal changes. A lot of these dogs, if you read my reports, you just see the, the terms nonspecific hepatopathy. Some mild changes to the coarseness or the echogenicity of the liver. Might be a little brighter than it should be. Might be a little uh, less dense. But, but that's okay because most of those cases we've ruled out the bad ones, the ones where we have to get the surgeons involved to lose the gallbladder, to take out the hepatocellular carcinoma, or to get biopsies for more significant lesions. Here we go. It's pretty normal liver. We're seeing some of the, the portal vasculature here. Uh, pretty typical uh, echogenicity. Not too bright, not too dark. Don't see significant dilation of the biliary ducts or the portal vasculature. I do a lot of hearts here, and so a lot of times I'm looking for an enlarged vena cava, or if we're worried that we could have a secondary hepatopathy from cardiac disease, that's what we're looking at. We're going to play Name That Disease. Everyone know what this one is? Yeah, yeah, it's our mucosal, so we see that. Uh, I don't eat a lot of fruit, unfortunately, um, but uh, I'm told that's what a kiwi looks like when you cut it. I like to use the term stellate in my reports. So you've got the little sunshine with its rays. Uh, Dr. Wong and Dr. Uh, Roach, the bald one, uh, did the... They did a talk a couple of months ago on gallbladder mucosal, so we won't spend a lot of time there. But hopefully most of us can identify this. Uh, and, and I won't rehash all of Dr. Wong's talk. But if we see this gallbladder uh, in an asymptomatic patient or, or symptomatic, I actually am worried about this one. It's got a little bit of fluid right there. That's what we call the gallbladder fossa. Uh, this, is, this is a short axis view, but you get it in sagittal view, so you can kind of see that pocketing of fluid. This dog might, we might need to think about surgery. We need to monitor that spot, because that might be a gallbladder that's starting to get a little hole, a little leaky, leaky uh, there. But we've got to remember that a lot of gallbladder mucosils can be medically managed, especially for those that uh, can't afford the surgery. Uh, asymptomatic dogs, I put a lot of them on Ursodiol and antibiotics and, and monitor the gallbladder. I have some that I've monitored for years. Uh, Dr. Wong takes a more aggressive approach, generally. Uh, it feels that it, when this dog is asymptomatic, you want it out now. Because uh, the ones I send home for medical management, Ursodiol, antibiotics, etc., Denimarin, uh, where we don't see the fluid in the gallbladder fossa region. We don't want them to, I warn them, vomiting, diarrhea, visible jaundice, got to get in now, not tomorrow, not next week, got to get in, check our bilirubin because that means the gallbladder could be going bad and needs to come out immediately. I warn folks with that and a lot of folks are happy and you know, have several you know, cockers, etc. that are out there for years and we're just monitoring this deadly looking gallbladder and they do fine. But when they get sick, they get sick quick and there's no, no time to waste. So that's a bit of an aside. Um, but yes, so we know what that one is. Anyone want to take a stab at what this one is? We, I think we can all agree that that's not a normal hepatic echotexture. Exactly. Yeah, so this is the poorly understood condition uh, we see in a lot of small uh, middle-aged to older dogs with liver disease, but also the foot pad lesions, nail, nail bed lesions, very painful feet. That's the honeycomb appearance, almost pathognomonic for hepatic cutaneous syndrome. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the treatment, but if you see a liver that looks like this, you got that, that, we're not wasting time. This one needs, we've got to get that one, get this dog checked out. But if you're ultrasounding this dog, this dog is probably very sick and, and not, not giving any clues. Oddly enough, that's also what a splenic torsion looks like, just for fun. Kind of gets that honeycomb appearance as it, as it infarcts, as it torses, if anyone sees those. But this is liver, because we're talking about the liver on Tuesday night.
And this one, this is the Dr. Vansel case. We see uh, heart, diaphragm. We're seeing multiple mixed echogenicity nodules. When I see one that looks like this, that's especially if this is a retriever uh, or Bernese, one of those, I'm thinking histiocytic neoplasia. Uh, this dog is, uh, to quote, uh, my GI mentor uh, from A&M, Dr. Willard, sounds crass, but small bag of dog food if they're eating, and they might not be. So yeah, when we see these multiple nodules, that's, that's usually a very, very bad situation. Now, we will come back to think of this image in the second half of the talk when we're talking about uh, chronic hepatitis in dogs. Uh, anyone want to take a stab at what this dog has? Until proven otherwise, this is a dead cirrhotic liver. This is either a long-term alcoholic dog or not. But this is that shriveled, lumpy, bumpy, tons of ascites, portal hypertension. Uh, this, we, we, in the second half of the talk, we're going to try and get to this dog before we get to this stage. So when you see the ascites, and, and you know, we see a fair number of dogs here that, that I see for suspected cardiac disease with ascites. Uh, if, if they have a heart murmur or if I'm really worried, I'll start at the heart. But if I'm not hearing a murmur and I don't have evidence of right heart failure, I'm looking at that liver. Because when the liver looks like that, our, our work here is likely done. And this dog's probably sick. And again, small bag to no bag of dog food. Would it be jaundice? Oh yeah, this dog very likely is going to be ectric because you, you have it's exceedingly insufficient liver right there. Do you often see it at that stage, or have you seen it? Uh, I, we do see some. I mean, kind of these poor doing. The yeah, some of them can, and, and it really stinks when we get them at that stage where they've just not been doing that well, and for whatever reason they couldn't get in. And then, but some of them seem to hang in there, especially the chow hounds that will eat through anything. And then finally they stop eating. It's like, yeah, the belly's been a little distended. Yeah, he's looked a little yellow. And then you see this one has a bilirubin of 36, and you look at that liver, uh, unfortunately, until, which I don't think will happen in my lifetime, start transplanting. This dog is very short for this world, unfortunately. Yeah, so, but when you see that ascites, you look at the liver, and it's got that lumpy, bumpy, shriveled appearance. You don't really see the, the vasculature, or the port, it's because everything collapses down. You get that bridging fibrosis that pro progresses to cirrhosis and then uh, apoptosis of all those hepatocytes and just collapses down. And you have a shriveled little piece of bacon here. Very sad. Uh, so we, we've imaged our liver with, ultra, with ultrasound or x-ray. What about additional diagnostics? Uh, FNA. Uh, I think they're great. They're easy, especially on these huge livers. Um, I, I used to do coax on all of them, but uh, a lot of, if money's an issue, I, I will stick a liver just gently with a little sedation if I have a squirmy dog. I really think that FNA of the liver has one big reason. Obviously, if you have a liver mass and you want to get a pre-surgical or pre-mortem diagnosis, uh, absolutely stick your liver nodules if you want to try and get a diagnosis there. Or if you have a very high suspicion of lymphoma. Those are the two times to stick most of your livers. Or if you want to prove that you have a vacuolar hepatopathy in a dog that's screaming Cushing's. But beyond that, as we say down here, FNA and, and biopsy only correlate around one-third of cases. And most of those are your vacuolar hepatopathies or cancer. You just, for our chronic hepatitis cases or, or the nonspecific uh, inflammatory hepatopathies, you just, you just don't get a lot of information. But occasionally when I have these middle-aged Labrador with, with an irregular liver, very sick dog, and the owners need some answers, they don't want to go all the way to biopsy, I will absolutely aspirate those because if you get this, your work here is done. And you got lymphoma. You see all the, you really don't see any hepatocytes. You just see a bunch of mixed, mostly large uh, lymphocytes. Your work there is done. And so that is, as I tell folks, if I'm aspirating a liver, trying to get a definitive answer, the definitive answer is probably going to be a bad one. So this dog, probably very jaundiced, probably very sick, probably not long for this world. So again, if you have a high index of suspicion for hepatic lymphoma, absolutely aspirate the liver. Although when they're really sick, you might want to do some coax because I have seen some of those dogs bleed. Not mine, because I have tremendous technique. But uh, here we go. Anyone want to take a stab at this one? Yeah, this is going to be fatty liver. Uh, I, I can't remember if I got this off a website for cats. We'll say it's a cat. So it's a cat. Yeah. So, so we can all pretty be pretty happy that these hepatocytes are filled with fat. Um, back in the day, meaning mid early two thousands, I would aspirate my fatty livers. But if it looks like a duck, you know the whole walks like a duck, just treat them. Get the red rubber tube in their neck as soon as possible. I don't aspirate them because you can all but guarantee that your your morbidly obese cat that hadn't eaten for ten days, that liver is going to look like that. And so you, you it almost looks like a, a, a lipoma aspirate with little uh, nuclei of the hepatocyte. So how about this one? We'll take a stab. So again, we don't have you know, these hepatocytes are 
Yeah, it, could they be vacuolar? Sure. Yeah, so this is going to be a vacuolar hepatopathy. And your pathologist will call this. You just have accumulation of glycogen and other substances in the hepatocytes. It doesn't usually help us that much unless we have a dog where we think it might be lymphoma, but you get this. But again, that, that tells you a whole lot of nothing. It just tells you you probably have to go looking for where the steroids or other substances are coming from. We'll talk about that in the second half. And in here, relatively normal hepatocytes, uh, maybe slight vacuolar change. Occasionally, if you're lucky or unlucky, depending on, you can get these columnar cells, and that means you've hit a biliary duct, because you can get columnar cells in the, in the biliary tree, but you're probably okay. So just to compare your normal round hepatocytes to the more columnar cells, that just means you've stuck and hit a, hit a duct, and you're probably going to be all right. A little bowel leaking out, no big deal. All right, so uh, in a town like Nashville, there are a lot of beer snobs, a lot of... Uh, food snobs, school snobs, whatever you want to be. I'm a liver biopsy snob uh, because I, when, when it comes to the point where we need to get a liver biopsy, I just want more tissue. I want more, more, more. So uh, Dr. Roach, the scoundrel that he is, uh, he gets my liver biopsies for me, uh, for p people that want to go that far, because there's just so much you can do. And it's so safe, no, more expensive, but so safe to get your laparoscopic biopsy. We'll come back to that in a second. So for definitive determination of nature and extent of hepatic damage and direct appropriate course of therapy for majority of our hepatopathies that we don't think are or, I mean, I'll, I'll admit, I've, I've biopsied some lymphomas in the past. Uh, biopsy is the way to go. Three ways to do it. Surgical, readily available, obviously the most invasive, uh, but you're, you're right there. Uh, I, I will say that my internist, um, you know, kind of not queasiness for blood, but wimpiness when it comes to blood, uh, used to do a fair number of needle biopsies, but now that laparosco laparoscopy is more available to me, I just haven't done them anymore. If you're going to do them, you probably have to go 16 gauge or larger. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at a study in just a second that compares some of this. 18 gauge, 20 gauge, you just don't get enough hepatic architecture on most of these samples. So I am a laparoscopic snob because you, you can get as many pieces as you want. You can do so much more with it, which we'll talk about a little later. Dr. Tweet um, did 150 consecutive liver biopsies and actually found that his number one is secondary reactive. And I will say the mo majority of liver biopsies we get done here are the ones we do at the same time as mucosal removal. And most of those are going to read out as a secondary reactive change to the gallbladder pathology. But we probably underestimate that so many of our hepatopathies are reactive, cardiovascular disease, but inflammatory bowel disease, cats and dogs. When we get those nonspecific cholangiohepatitis suspect cases, it's probably originating in the GI tract. And the secondary changes, especially with your neutrophilic <laughs> hepatopathies, um, if you see my reports and we're, we're treating a lot of these dogs uh, with metronidazole or sedile or whatever, we're just presuming that it's a secondary or reactive hepatopathy. And those dogs that respond beautifully to ursodiol and metronidazole, it probably is. And we successfully treated that dog, at least at that time in the world, uh, for a secondary change. Now, the second group, which we're going to spend a lot of time in the second hour talking about chronic hepatitis, so primary or uh, non-reactive hepatopathies, number two, and then the rest of them, all pretty typical, neoplasia, vacuolar hepatopathies, pull our hair out, third and fourth, and then vascular anomalies, um, probably getting biopsied at the time of... Uh, of um, shunt surgery or uh, looking for uh, 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 microvascular dysplasia, portal vein hypoplasia. I'm a big fan in these, these dogs that uh, have the bile acid of 39 postprandial and we're, we haven't been spayed yet. You know, I will frequently say, well, let's get your dog spayed, let's get a biopsy, and you'll get, you, you, that's how you're going to get your microvascular portal vein hypoplasia dysplasia. Acute liver damage and other miscellaneous conditions on his biopsies. So here's the, uh, now again, I pick on Dr. Center. I do think she is, because uh, I've known multiple of her residents and interns. She is absolutely crazy person, but she is absolutely brilliant. And so she is uh, the number two liver guru that I pay attention to. This is a study, if you've ever seen her. Has anyone seen Dr. Center talk? Frizzy gray hair. You know, usually talks about 20 minutes into the next lecture uh, with no concern over who's trying to get her off the stage. Um, study that she and her Cornell group did around 15 years ago now where they looked at needle, I think 16, 18 gauge needle and wedge biopsies, so either laparoscopic or surgical in the same dogs, blinded the pathologist and, and looked at these. So 124 dogs and cats that were biopsied in this study. And again, these dogs and cats all had needle and wedge, either surgical or laparoscopic biopsies performed. So a lot of words, I don't even know if you can read it on your handout, but we won't go through a lot of the detail, but we'll look here. So for individual examiners where they had 
the pathologist blinded to the entire study. I don't know if they gave him history or not, to be honest with you. But they looked at the needle biopsies and the wedge biopsies and only found between 56 to 67 percent agreement. So that means you could have as many as 44 percent of your needle biopsies that don't agree with the larger wedge biopsies. Um, and that's concerning. So that means if you're doing smaller gauge needle biopsies on dogs, at least according to this study, you could be missing up to 44 uh, percent of your um, cases getting a, an appropriate diagnosis. And, and what they really go on and on about in this study and for those liver snobs, you just have to get all those portal triads. You've got to get all those to compare. Bridging fibrosis is a major change we're looking for in liver biopsies. You can't tell if it's bridging if you don't have the landmarks in your liver biopsy to see where they're bridging to and from. So. 48% of animals diagnosis assigned needle biopsy compared with definitive diagnosis on the wedge biopsy. They uh, they concurred 48%. Now, that's a little scary. And so uh, probably, a, a, probably a bit of a biopsy snob because I have ready access to laparoscopy and have for a long time. But you look at this study and, and you got to worry. But hey, you know, there are plenty of, uh, the cost for laparoscopic biopsy by the time we do blood work, pre-anesthetic stuff, it's a two grand. So it's not cheap. And so there are plenty, plenty of dogs out there that I've recommended it. You can't do it. Um, it's okay. You know, if you have needle biopsy is the only way to go, you do your best. You just realize that there are some limitations. And so that's how I approach this. Fortunately, here in Nashville, everyone's wealthy apparently. Not really, but uh, not me. Um, we, we, we do our best. We do get to do quite a few of these um, so I can still be a snob. I'm not a snob in any other aspect of my life, I like to think. So, again, biopsy specimens must be interpreted with caution from the needle biopsy. So now we're going to go more from a clinical aspect. Well, first we've been spending time on, uh, on diagnostics. Now we're going to spend a little more time on the actual clinical aspect when we're encountered or uh, when dogs come to us with abnormal liver enzymes. So this is a, a flow chart you can use. Um, so the dog comes to you with abnormal liver enzymes. A lot of the ones I see are asymptomatic. Uh, and then, of course, you have the symptomatic ones. So just, this is just a brief reminder of how we approach. Um, always look for that non-hepatic disease or drug history. Chronic vomiting diarrhea. Is this a reactive hepatopathy? We're always looking, especially with the alkaline phosphatase cases, looking for the steroids. Remembering that topical steroids are a great way for dogs to lick their owners and, um, and get Cushing's. You also will read these random reports of diet-related Cushing's, which uh, I've never seen or that I may have seen me. Um, so we'll do all of that. Now the ones that have obvious, the jaundice ones, we're going to go straight to working up the liver. But what about those cases asymptomatic and um, you know, we're not quite ready to, or the owners can't jump into a, a large workup? I never think it's inappropriate, especially when you have an ALT elevation, considering that so many of our hepatopathies can either be uh, bacterial in origin or the reactive ones with concurrent IBD. I love being flagyl, 10 bucks. Give them a month of flagyl. Pick your liver support agent. We're going to go into them a little bit later, shortly, um, and, and pretty quickly go through all the ones that are available. Never inappropriate, especially in the asymptomatic dog, to throw some denimerin, ursodiol, SAMe, and an antibiotic and recheck values. Never inappropriate for the asymptomatic ones. The ones with the bilirubin of 19, highlighter yellow, may not be the most appropriate course. In this, when you, if you found the non hepatic disease, obviously treat it and then reevaluate the liver. Or the asymptomatic ones, you do the course of antibiotics, liver support, come back and reevaluate. And then at that point, if your liver enzymes aren't where you want them, and they're non-jaundice, this is where we probably need to throw on that fasting bile acid. Because again, greater than 25 uh, on your fasting bile acid with the chronic elevation of your enzymes, especially the ALT, that probably is what we need for a relatively reasonable price to start doing the more advanced diagnostics, whether it's imaging uh, all the way up to biopsy. So the asymptomatic patient. As we're well, very well aware, especially alkaline phosphatase, my friend and my enemy, uh, very nonspecific. You can't look at a liver enzyme pattern uh, unless you have a morbidly obese cat with a high alkphos, high bilirubin, hadn't eaten in 10 days. You probably know what you're dealing with there. We may not know why they got hepatic lipidosis. You probably need to spend some time figuring that out. But very nonspecific. And, of course, we have to interpret in light of history, medications, and clinical findings. Hopefully everyone here sees this dog with an alkaline phosphatase of 3,600, platelet count of 900,000. We probably don't need to biopsy this dog's liver. We probably need to look at something to do with the adrenals. So please don't biopsy that liver yet. Do, do some additional testing. Maybe run a little, uh, I, I'm a low-dose person. 
But ACTH STEM, if that's your thing, more power to you. So now we're going to go with these specific enzymes, the ALT. Uh, when we have a chronically or acutely elevated ALT, in the big picture, big scheme of things, now if you have a dog, one-year-old dog that's been out in the pasture eating mushrooms and your ALT's 5,000, uh, we probably know what we're dealing with. It's a toxic hepatopathy, you know, you know, the ones that are more straightforward. But either the asymptomatic patient or maybe a little lethargic, slightly ill patient with a chronically or acutely increased ALT, that's the disease we've got to find, figure out. We need to get that diagnosed sooner rather than later. We're going to spend a good bit of time a little bit later talking about that. With chronic hepatitis, and again, we're just, it's an umbrella term. You, know, we, we, you hear the term chronic active hepatitis. You hear about the urban hep. We're not really. We're just talking about chronic inflammatory hepatitis in, in big scheme. Tends to be more of a female disease, and uh, there's certainly breed-associated conditions that are well known, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So with significant disease, and again, this is where we're probably underutilizing the fasting bile acid, you pair that increased serum ALT with an increased bile acid, that's your trigger. That, again, in a non-ictric patient, they're trying to catch these dogs before intra- or post-hepatic disease causes jaundice, that's going to be your best, that, that's your best sensitivity and specificity in your readily available chemistry analyses that you probably have significant hepatobiliary disease. Not your alkphosa 3500 and that little dioxin with Cushing's. Talking about the ALT with the high bile acids. So alkaline phosphatase, again, we spent a good bit of time talking about it. It comes from bone, liver, readily induced in dogs, again, dogs, for multiple medications, with, again, steroids being 1 through 500, the ones you're looking at, but certainly the, the dog that uh, you occasionally see these sad cases, a uh, dog had uh, diagnosed presumed idiopathic epilepsy at age 2, had its last seizure at age 3, I'm seeing it at 11 on 8 years of phenobarbital. You have an alkphos of, of 3,000, ALT of 1,500, and the liver's shriveled. You know, that's, um, so we, we can't underestimate uh, the, the anticonvulsants, especially if you're really old school and pull out primidone, some of those. So again, uh, other drugs and herbs probably involved, but again, glucocorticoids 1 to 500, some anticonvulsants are the ones we need to worry about as far as our drug history. And again, when we have moderate to marked increases without jaundice, it's probably, probably drug induction or corticosteroid excess. So we, we always got to remember that most of the time our alkaline phosphatase is either from intra, uh, intra, intra dog or extra dog corticosteroid excess or drug induction. So this is a condition that, that uh, probably out there all the time. We look at this liver biopsy, we can all appreciate. There's, you got some hepatocytes in there, sinusoids, and, and just a whole lot of fat. The term idiopathic vacuolar hepatopathy. This condition being out there is why I do not push these alkaline phosphatase dogs to biopsy because the vast majority of them, you're going to get something that looks like this. You're going to spend that money on the biopsy. I do have clients out there, and I have asked some of these high intensity clients, can you sleep with your dog having an alkphos of 400? And they say, no, I can't. It's like, well, we're going to biopsy it, but we're going to get this. And we usually get this. And I say, now we've got to keep looking. They've already had low dose dexamethasone, they've already had all those tests. So, with this, before we can call something idiopathic vacuolar hepatopathy, we've got to rule out corticosteroid excess of some sort, whether it's exogenous or endogenous. So we've done the lotus dex, done the ACTH stem, and we haven't found anything. Now this, talking about my friend and my enemy, that, that UT sex panel, uh, it's neat, the science is great. Just I, after years and years of running them, I still don't know what the hell to do with that test most of the time. Because we're putting these dogs on melatonin, we're putting them on lignans. I, I think it's good science. I just, you know, do we need to start running those on dogs that have this? Maybe. I, I just get so frustrated trying to determine what to do. And um, you, you get, they tell you to do one to three months of melatonin. And if the dog's no better over that time, clients start getting cranky. So maybe these are the, the adrenal steroids. Maybe it is 17 hydroxy beta, beta progesterone, whatever. So, because uh, we know the progesterones can bind to the hepatocyte corticosteroid receptor and induce just like steroids can. So, so this condition's out there, and because it's out there, and because I've biopsy dogs and gotten these stupid biopsies that you don't really know what to do with, I, I do not push unless I have the owner that cannot sleep with the dog with the elevated alkaline phosphatase. Especially if it's a Scotty, because Scotties, through Dr. Tweet's work as well as some work at Cornell, they are the breed with, you know, this is the spe script spelling B word, idiopathic hyperalkaline phosphatasemia, or, or idiopathic alkaline phosphatase increases. Um, if I have a Scotty with an increased ALP, I, I ultrasound the liver and find the, the, uh, the, the tumor in the bladder. Because um, we just, the, the, 
this breed is known to have, it can be pretty significant. Work them up, you don't find anything. So if you have an old Scotty with a high alkaline phosphatation, you're deciding whether to do the dental. I don't care what the alkaline is, do the dental. Don't worry about it. They're going to be fine. But do find the bladder tumor because that is, uh, seems like 90% of what we see Scotties for now, unfortunately, is transitional cell carcinoma. But remember that is me being a smart, ale smart aleck, keep my words right, smart aleck regarding alkaline phosphatase, you can see it. You can see hepatic neoplasia with just alkaline phosphatase increases, probably several a year. Benign hyperplasia as well, a much happier condition. So again, going back to what I said earlier, the high alkaline phosphatase dog, asymptomatic, want to do a dental, lump removal, whatever. Peace of mind, if nothing else, to ultrasound these dogs or take x-rays or whatever, because uh, you can, and I have certainly have seen a number of cases with pretty large hepatic masses without ALT elevation. Doesn't make a lot of sense. You destroying those cells with cancer, you think the ALT would come up. So again, no, it's um, not invasive. Depending on your uh, tax bracket, can be uh, affordable to get a good ultrasound. So again, if non-icteric and you're worried or if you've monitored and seen chronic or progressive elevations uh, of your liver enzymes in dogs, this is again where we probably, before we take the next step, do that fasting bile acid and see where we are. And again, value greater than 25 with chronic or progressive liver enzyme elevations, especially the ALT, that's probably what needs to be done. Or, I mean, you can do the ultrasound at any time, but uh, if you get that high fasting bile acid with the chronic or progressive ALT elevation, that's the time to consider taking the next step of diagnosis. So again, ultrasound we talked about, liver biopsy in the prior hour. We're going to spend a, a good bit of our time talking about chronic hepatitis. Uh, again, poorly described disease, it's just inflammation similar to IBD uh, in, the, in the intestinal tract. It's just chronic inflammation within the hepatic parenchyma. And as you'll notice when the Wasava group, World um, Small Animal Veterinary Association, they have liver standardization, they have IBD standardizations. It's a pretty neat group of, of very smart people that meet in various locales around the world. Uh, by definition, it means hepatocyte death from apoptosis or necrosis, variable mononuclear, so our lymphoplasmacytics typically, maybe some, uh, some um, histiocytic macrophage um, involvement, are mixed inflammatory. So it includes all of the hepatopathies. If you want to read some of Dr. Tweets and Dr. Centers and their, their groups more specific, work, you'll see the lymphoplasmacytic portal hepatitis, you'll see the, the subrutive hepatitis cases, it includes all of them. So chronic hepatitis, uh, this includes the umbrella for all of them. But where it's important when we're talking about all of these pathology words, what our goal as clinicians is as these chronic hepatitis cases progress, cirrhosis results. And so that's where we need to, to be better at jumping in and trying to stop this process. Because again, you get that liver that's a shriveled piece of bacon with a pound of ascites on a small dog, it's too late. We can't transplant livers. We, we're not Steve Jobs. We can't get pancreatic and liver transplants. Uh, once, once, once it hits that stage, that is a dying terminal dog. And so here, of course, is a, this is the ult, what that ultrasound is showing. That is, we hope all agree, is not a healthy liver. That is a liver that is collapsed. You're probably not going to find uh, any, you will, you'll find some, but you're not going to find many normal hepatocytes on that biopsy. You're going to see a lot of terms like bridging fibrosis, cirrhosis, necrosis, um, and just unidentifiable hepatic tissue because this liver is shot. Um, so again, and we'll talk a little bit at the end of the talk about uh, some of the complications of more advanced chronic hepatitis, such as what we have up here. So again, unfortunately, it's most commonly a female condition across the breeds, uh, especially Dobermans. Uh, average age, so again, this is not usually an old dog condition when we're talking about uh, chronic hepatitis. This is a middle-aged dog. And Dr. Roach and I in my 15, well, I'm in less January, um, the vast majority that we've been biopsying and diagnosing this are, are I had one we biopsied Friday and uh, should have biopsy results tomorrow, seven-year-old, seven Fantastic, sweetest dog ever, uh, Billy Rubin a two. I, I think that dog's going to be gone in about three to six months because we uh, just, after it got off, seven-year-old dog, best hunting dog this fellow's ever had, hunted duck season, and you, loses weight during duck season, gains it back once season's over, just wasn't gaining the weight back. And asymptomatic otherwise, slightly decreased appetite, uh, ALT 2000, alkaline phosphatase 400, and um, a little bit of ascites and we biopsy in that liver. Not, not as bad as the one on the previous slide. So when we think of chronic hepatitis, this is usually middle-aged dogs, many times female, although I've certainly seen enough males to get worried about it. It's not an old dog disease unless you're picking them up at the very end stage. 
greater than 10 years of age, that's, that's when most condition cancer is going to jump up. So non-malignant, non-cancerous uh, hepatic disease, middle-aged dogs. And the signs, as you'd expect, parallel the extent of liver damage. For earlier on in the disease course, uh, nonspecific GI signs, uh, but as it progresses, this is where we've lost the game. When we start seeing these clinical signs in these chronic hepatitis dogs, we are, we're, the eight ball is we're, we're miles behind it. Again, this is where I can't, um, can't jump in enough and say that ALT is what we're watching here. Alkaline phosphatase can do whatever it wants. In most cases, I'm usually not that worried about it. But if we see consistent and especially progressive ALT elevations, again, alkaline phosphatase, the cholestatic enzymes are not that worried. But ALT, uh, that's the one we're watching here. So ALP, ALT elevation in an asymptomatic dog, especially a middle-aged female, large breed dog, that's where we jump to the front of that diagnostic line, in my opinion, especially if you tie it with the, uh, the, the bile acids, uh, as we've been talking about so much during this talk. And again, as with the advanced disease, after we've lost our ability to get any information from the bile acids, when the bilirubin increases and the albumin decreases, uh, again, we, we, we're losing that game. So presumptive diagnosis. If you have your segment, middle-aged female usually, but plenty of males can be affected. History, which can be pretty nonspecific, just like uh, the, the female dog saw Black Lab Rio, uh, just didn't quite kick back in after hunting season. Just didn't quite uh, get back up to her uh, body weight. Uh, and then we found on two subsequent uh, liver enzyme evaluations, uh, you know, ALT, uh, progressive over two evaluations. Definitive diagnosis, again, can't state enough. You can presumptively diagnose it, but liver biopsy of some form, you, FNA does not help you unless you're looking for lymphoma. And, and there's a slight chance that Rio could have that. I don't think she's going to, but uh, I, I didn't, didn't get the, that lymphoma vibe. She's still pretty happy, although her Billy Rubin's around too. Real sick dogs with, with liver disease, I'll, I'll poke them for, to see if I get lymphoma. But again, FNA doesn't help. You've got to get the liver biopsy to get your definitive answer. And this is where it's a killer. We usually don't uh, figure out what causes this, similar to a lot of our protein-losing nephropathies. By the time the PLN dogs show up to us with the UPCs of 10, uh, unless they had heartworm disease or unless they have severe skin allergy, you know, so our antigen and body complexes are common, we don't figure, we don't know. And so we're, we're pretty much behind on this. We don't know what caused it. We just know where we are. We're somewhere in the cascade of liver insult leading to the, to the cascade of inflammation, fibrosis, and then cirrhosis. Uh, there are a number of breeds specific. The biggest one, anyone seen a Bedlington in the last 10 years? Uh, dog yeah, exactly. I mean, you read all. If you read anything on chronic hepatitis, you're going to talk about the Bedlingtons. To my knowledge, I have not actually seen one in the flesh. I mean, I see them on the when the kids are watching the AKC, the whatever the the, uh, the dog shows, but I've never seen one. But if you do, check its ALT. Um, so, uh, of course, in people, we all know people that uh, or know of, especially celebrities with uh, questionable lifestyles, perhaps. Uh, the viral hepatitis cases, are um, you know, that's the vast majority of what you see in people. Just never really found that link in dogs. Uh, you read about adenovirus in young dogs. Uh, and perhaps adenovirus at a young age could lead to this cascade, but probably not, because most of these patients are going to be well vaccinated. So just never really found that. Atypical left aspires. Um, after I did my residency, I had published uh, with Dr. Craig Green in Georgia a uh, leptospirosis paper. So uh, did a lot of talks on lepto. And, and you read this study from, I believe, 1996, 97, uh, where a kennel of beagles uh, all came down with chronic hepatitis. They all got biopsy, and they found atypical left aspires. So Dr. Green, based on that study, truly feels that you know, we think of leptospirosis as being a renal infection, which it is primarily nowadays, a uh, vast, vast majority. But could there be serovars of leptospirosis that get in, may or may not cause the renal carrier state? Can they get in the liver, cause a low-grade illness that clears, but they set up shop in the liver, and over months and probably years, just through low-grade inflammation, do we catch these dogs years down the road with cirrhosis? And so that one group of beagles from, I believe, the mid-90s, they suspected it, but it's never been proven again. You can uh, MAT these dogs all you want. You can do the PCR. It's not going to be in the blood. Concern is that it's been sitting in the liver for years, and we catch them at the end stage of the chronic cascade of inflammation, fibrosis, or cirrhosis. Uh, other studies uh, have, have tried to tie a helicobacter. Of course, that's more of a gastric ulcer, gastritis, bacteria, Bartonella. If you're from North Carolina State, no Dr. Breitschwert causes every disease. Um, known to man, 
If you are from the Mediterranean, leishmaniasis uh, has been implicated. Uh, easy ones, aflatoxicosis, chronic or, or acute, can uh, lead to this. And then drug-induced. Um, the easy ones that, that, that I have seen, unfortunately, a number over the years, phenobarbital, don't use a lot of phenytoin or primidone, uh, but we know that those can bake dog livers. And then NSAIDs, I don't know if anyone, it was probably late 90s where there's concern for hepatopathies in, in Labradors on Remedil uh, against question mark. Uh, never, in my opinion, been definitively proven, but, but sure. I mean, if, if there's a drug reaction that causes enough of an insult to set up the cascade, absolutely. We can't rule anything out because we've never proven the vast majority of these what, what triggers this. What, what about some other etiologies? How about immune mediated? I'm an internist. We love immune mediated disease. You just give them steroids and they either do, they either do great or they, they, you get yelled at for the pred side effects. Uh, likely exist, especially in the Dobermans, uh, as we'll get to in a little bit, uh, but it's never been proven through various immunohistochemical studies. The theory, which is a good one, that some insulting agent trauma, virus, uh, in, well, whatever, uh, damages the hepatocytes, the, the antigens are released, the body recognizes them just as they would in, in lupus, IMHA, ITP, whatever, whatever tells the immune system to be, to, to act aberrantly. Secondary immune response perpetuates the influx of inflammatory cells and the chronic hepatitis, and it's supported by the fact that, that a good number of these dogs, especially the dobies, tend to respond favorably to immunosuppressive therapies, just like mycophenolate, which over the last year or two has really taken off with the young crowd, and I've jumped in with them because it's now pretty cheap and a lot cheaper than the cyclosporin. So for various conditions, you see mycophenolate flying off the shelves like Serenia around here. Here's the big one, and this is the one we, we probably need to, to really pay attention to, especially, uh, although I find that the Frenchie is the dog of Nashville. Uh, it was the Cavalier in Memphis, but I think the Frenchie scourge has, has hit us. Um, but for those who still like the old classic retrievers, um, this is the, the disease we really need to be paying attention to. So, copper hepatitis. Uh, one of two ways it happens. And, and sometimes we can't tell, and a lot times it doesn't really necessarily matter, but it's either a metabolic defect where these dogs can't metabolize copper in the diet appropriately, or, and I think this is probably more frequent, and certainly in the biopsies I do, that it's secondary from uh, abnormal hepatic function altering the excretion. So it either can't metabolize what's in the diet, in the breed specific ones, or it's a secondary event, and, and from the biopsies we'll talk about in a minute show you how we, how we do that. Again, you have to do liver biopsy. Your serum levels don't do anything for you, even if you can get those. Uh, a couple of special stains and quantitative analysis. So here we have ronidine stain. Um, not the best picture, but all these little red spots, that's, that's the ronidine being picked up. Now, going back to my, my rant as a, as a liver biopsy snob, um, won't tell IDEX this. I don't send my liver biopsies next door because you just you don't know who you're going to get. When I want my liver biopsies, I want I want the package, and the breed or excuse me the the client cost for my liver biopsies with markups to go to Colorado State where I send them. Doctor, it's not Doctor Twee, he's not a pathologist, but his group, two hundred seventeen dollars, fifty dollar overnight shipping, so two hundred eighty dollars, and you get the whole package. You get regular uh, histopathology. But you also get copper concentration, dry weight. They can do that on formalin fixed samples, so you don't have to send it in any special medium. And you get all the stains, fibrosis stains. You get the iron stains, which I don't know what to do with because I mean, we don't really know what iron hepatopathies are. But you get the copper stains. You get the quantitation, which is very, very important. Uh, and, and, and for no additional cost, if they think you might have a fungal hepatitis, they, they throw all those stains in for free. So 217 plus 52 shipping, whatever that is, that's what it costs, where it's just a routine liver biopsy next door, won't tell IDEX, is about $320. And you don't get any, you have to add on those additionals. So that's where I begged and pleaded with Bo to let me send my liver biopsies out because you get so much, for your so much more for your money and just so much more just in general. You don't have to add on, they do it. Uh, I, by tomorrow, we, we biopsied that dog Rio on Friday. I'll be shocked if by tomorrow morning I don't have my histopathology. By the end of the week, I'll have my copper quantitation. And by next week, I'll have all my fibrosis and uh, iron stains in-house. So within about 10 days, we're going to get all that. What, do we, what about the copper? I'm going on about copper. So in, in that majority of dogs, copper concentration is less than 400 microgram per gram dry weight uh, with secondary accumulation. And so these are the dogs that have uh, non-copper, non, non, the non-familial breed-associated hepatopathies. You're usually going to get a value 4 to 800. So these dogs probably don't need uh, chelation. They probably just need general treatment of the underlying hepatopathy. 
But the dogs that have breed associated, typically greater than, I don't worry about zone 1 or zone 3, I can't remember what that means anymore, but greater than 800, especially greater than 1500. So a lot of my, if you give me a Labrador, uh, I'm very curious to see what Rio's going to have. If we're in that four to 800 range, or less than 400, but 4 to 800, it's going to be secondary. The whatever inflammatory hepatopathy, hopefully not lymphoma, is in Rio, probably don't need to chelate. But you get 1,000, 1,500 or above, those dogs need chelation. So very valuable. And again, through CSU, you get that as part of the liver uh, panel uh, with histopathology. So again, the Bedlington Terrier, a, a dog that exists in my mind only in pictures, uh, is, is inherited autosomal defect. Uh, Dr. Deger's group up at uh, Cornell found it, and so it's basically eliminated from the breed. So if you want to go get a Bedlington, according to most papers and through good, good genetic counseling, it shouldn't be in it. But again, I think it's a phantom dog that lives in pictures now. But again, other breeds. Big one's the Doberman. Big one's the Labrador. Those are the two I worry most about. Westies. Does anyone know this is a Sky Terrier? It's got there, yeah. Don't see many of those. I, I would call it a long-haired Yorkie. But um, <laughs> Dalmatians, which, uh, which uh, seven of them just got bear testing today, $1,000. They can be yours. Uh, they just got bear tested with Dr. Uh, Dr. House, so they can hear. But again, the big ones here, the take-home, the Dobies and the, and the Labradors, those are the ones we really need to be worrying about for breed-specific copper hepatitis. In Dobermans, again, the uh, vast majority of the dogs I see have bad hearts. Uh, but again, this is all, unlike the DCM, which is almost, well, not all the time, but I see a lot more males with DCM. This is almost exclusively females for some reason. And again, it's that typical um, uh, chronic hepatitis age, middle age. And we, it has been shown in these, these female Dobies that they do have major, major compatibility major is compatibly complex too. So anyway, we think this is probably an immune mediated. These dogs tend to respond pretty well to prednisone and or other um, immunosuppressives. Uh, Labradors, again, Labradors have plenty of reasons to get that nonspecific it, liver insult leading to the cascade of fibrosis cirrhosis. So when I see a Labrador that I'm getting ready to biopsy or have biopsy, I'm not condemning it, to, and, and, and it's not a disease you necessarily have to condemn, but I'm not worried about them having it. But if they do, a lot of these dogs can be successfully managed with chelation and then low copper diets. Obviously the LD diet is good. I just find, as with many diets, they like the Royal Canin. So I have a lot of my liver dogs on the Royal Canin hepatic. I don't know if anyone else has used that diet, but um, especially for the sicker dogs, they tend to eat it better, but uh, LD is perfectly acceptable. What about now that we've uh, diagnosed this, um, what, how do we treat it? Obviously, if we can find the primary etiology, we remove it, but it's rarely that simple. Similar to our PLE dogs, or PLN dogs, we just have to treat what's there because we don't usually have the, the etiologic agent. Dietary manipulation, copper restricted diets, LD and, and Royal Canin hepatic. And then specific treatment, reducing inflammation, fibrosis and or copper, basic hepatic support, and treating the secondary complications. We'll, we'll go through this and We'll be done here. So anti-inflammatories. Uh, the goal is to, uh, obviously, in, in all of our lives, it's, it's nice to reduce our hepatocellular death. Me from years at LSU. I can't reverse that. But um, for our patients, uh, we want to reverse hepatocellular death because that leads to fibrosis, that leads to cirrhosis, and that leads to uh, a small bag of dog food. So for the dogs, especially the ones that have m moderate to marked lymphoplasmacytic inflammatory change, these absolutely go on prednisone, just like you would your, your uh, lymphoplasmacytic IBD dogs. Uh, standard doses, I usually try and keep them uh, less than 2 mg per kg per day. Uh, milder cases might even go a little bit lower to the anti-inflammatory range, but it, it's a clinical judgment what dose you choose. Now, this Dr. Tweet screams from the ceiling that you have to re-biopsy these dogs. I, I'll admit I don't do that very often at all. It's another two grand. You actually just, you just watch them. Uh, and now, he, he reminds you you have to worry about when you have these dogs on steroids, you really can't. But you, can, you can't use alkaline phosphatase. It's going to go wherever it wants once it's been induced. So if it came in with a high phosphate, it's going to keep a high phosphate. But I find that, that these dogs, you can use your bilirubin if they were jaundiced, and especially their ALT. You will get some uh, steroid hepatopathy ALT increase, but these dogs come in with an alk of 1,500. You treat them with steroids, they're clinically better, and alk is now 400. You've done something. So I, I don't want to disagree with Dr. Tweet. 
sweet, but I do feel that I, not the alkaline phosphatase, not the GGT, but you can use ALT in a lot of these cases. If they're doing well clinically and the ALT has gone down, I feel you can use your liver enzymes. He again recommends to re-biopsy after a couple, several months of therapy to see where you are. I rarely, if ever, recommend that. For those where you have uh, high, especially the Dobermans, uh, where you're worried about an inflammatory, or excuse me, immune-mediated, uh, azathioprine, cyclosporine, as well as mycophenolate. Not a lot of great studies on these as there are most diseases in, in veterinary medicine. But if I have one that I have a very strong index of suspicion for immune-mediated disease, prednisone, and now as with most of my immune-mediated conditions, mycophenolate is where we're going. But again, none of these have been looked at closely, controlled studies, etc. Uh, about 10 megs per keg, twice a day. Yeah, and usually I just kind of look at the dog and say, you about a 500, and you're about a 250. Yeah, so that's, that's where it is. And, and I, I don't hesitate to go up if I'm not getting the response. Cause it's, other than diarrhea. See, a fair number of dogs, they get diarrhea. Uh, I, love the, I love the drug. And I was very hesitant. I've always been a uh, cyclosporine person. Uh, it's been a lot of years using the generic modified cyclosporine. But then Atopica came out, and then you have that guilt. I have this very expensive product on the shelf that's veterinary approved. I think I'm supposed to use that. But I like right now, the. it's still expensive to use the modified generic, but uh, as I had that guilt of writing prescriptions when Atopica is staring at me, um, mycophenolate now is a readily available generic. So I've really jumped the train to mycophenolate. Okay. So again, uh, going to copper reduction. Now again, if you get the quantitation, which you get as part of the liver panel through CSU, greater than 1,000, especially 1,500. That's what the, the lab at CSU says. Anything greater than 1,500, you have you have copper toxicity. But uh, in general, greater than 1,000 on your, on your biopsy is when we need to chelate. And this is where it sucks. Uh, I've never used triantine. I know it's expensive. Penicillamine, we're probably all familiar with that. It's an old drug. Uh, biopsy to dog, that actually came in for, uh, and this is where I think everything went the way it was supposed to, came in for, it's an old eight-year-old uh, Labrador, came in, name is Buzzy, came in to Dr. Uh, Calfee for uh, T TPLO, yes, that's the thing, um, TPLO surgery and Alcfos 700, and largely asymptomatic, but uh, th this, this owner is extremely dedicated, uh, copyright lawyer as I recall, so money was no issue, we did an ultrasound, liver looked terrible, not... Uh, uh, Hepatic cutaneous liver bad, but but looked really bad. But this guy, you know, actually Dr. Calfee was not too comfortable proceeding. So next day or two, we got Dr. Roach and I. We got the biopsies, uh, copper hepatopathy. He was somewhere 1,800 or so. And so this this is we're probably nine ten months out. We penicillamine. So called it in to a local pharmacy. Not, I hadn't used it in, in a few months. Uh, it's going to be about six thousand dollars a month. And even uh, Buzzy's owner said, hold on. <laughs> and I said, I, I know, hold on, yeah, we, we don't want to do that. Because you usually have to treat for a minimum of three months. Um, so we actually went through Wedgwood and found that I think we're getting it $160, $180 a month. So we're compounding it, uh, and by all accounts, it's just as effective. So don't write penicillamine. So even at Costco, you're looking at several thousand a month. So I don't even know why they keep those drugs on the shelf if they're going to cost that much. So we, we, you go through the specialty pharmacies, and you can get it at a much reasonable cost. Prices here, you do have to give it on an empty stomach, as is known from, from older studies, that giving it with food uh, can pretty significantly uh, affect its re, its resor the absorption, although a lot of dogs will get sick on it. And a lot of these dogs are sick to start, so if you have to cheat and give it with food, you just realize you might not get the uh, effectiveness. So. Again, the goal in an ideal world, you do that for about three months, and if the dog's doing well, re-biopsy, see if they're decoppered, get that again. I don't usually do that. I usually just arbitrarily in a dog that's doing well at three to four months, get them off, and then switch to oral zinc. For those of you who love uh, heavy metal, I love heavy metal music, but heavy metal metabolism, remember the uh, metallothionine, all that sound familiar, how they c compete. So you switch to oral zinc that competes with the binding to metallothionine in the hepatocyte, and then you which allows for easier copper uh, extraction uh, and, and release from the body. So antifibrotic, it's got a lot, a lot, of, good, um, a lot of good benefits all on its own, hepatoprotective, but again, in the decoppered patient, it, it's going to compete with copper in the hepatocyte uh, when it binds to metallothionine. So the dose is just roughly 50 to 100 milligrams per dog every 12 hours. Usually we'll tolerate it, although some dogs do get sick on it. So again, ideal world, rebiopsy. I usually just arbitrarily say you're doing pretty well. It's been about three to four months. We'll go to a much cheaper copper and continue to monitor. And at that stage, if you're not on steroids, then you can absolutely use your ALT as a long-term monitoring tool. 
For those of you who've sent me liver cases, I love this drug. It's, it's doggy liver magic, ursodiol. Uh, of course, as the name implies, it's based on a synthetic uh, version of bear bile. Unfortunately, many bears died to tell us that their bile was healthy. For people with uh, uh, for hepatic disease, uh, it's hepatoprotective. I think it's the most potent out there. It, uh, According to smart people who research this drug, it, it changes the bile acid pool to less hepatotoxic, more hydrophilic bile acids which uh, sounds good and should lead to healthier livers, reduces inflammation and has that, I love this term, immunomodulatory, flagyls immunomodulatory, azithromycin in cat noses we think is immunomodulatory. So basically it's magic. It reduces inflammation through un, un, uh, mis, not understood mechanisms. Those 10 to 15 mg per kg every 12, 24 hours. So if I have a slightly symptomatic or symptomatic or, or a dog that comes to me and we see one of those horrific, not, not mucosal necessarily, but the huge gallbladder full of nasty sludge, they all go on Ursodial. So uh, now it's available. It used to only be available in 300 milligram capsules, which have to get recompounded. But now, for the majority of our dogs, except for the little pixies, you can quarter these. It's a little difficult. It's an oblong pill, but you can quarter those and dose just about anyone out the door without having to get it recompounded. So all of my chronic hepatopathy dogs go on Ursodial because it's, it's, it's liver magic. Like Sotolol is, is uh, boxer magic for their arrhythmias. Um, so key point of therapy uh, with, with antifibrotics, you, you want to, before we start worrying about the fibrosis, we got to stop the inflammation because this is a cascade, hepatic insult, inflammation leading to fibrosis. So as much as I'd like to say there's some wonderful antifibrotic drugs out there, and in, liver, and in prednisone, prednisolone, um, it, it's of antifibrotic effects, but it's mostly anti-inflammatory. So before we get caught up in whether or not we pull out colchicine, let's stop the inflammation and reverse it. Um, again, all of us who we went to vet school in the 90s or, for, or earlier, colchicine was always recommended, but there's been no good data, and most of the liver gurus have gone away from it. So we really don't use that anymore. In people, again, no, no clinical studies in dogs other than anecdotal reports. Losartan, which I've pulled out for a few of my more advanced uh, protein-losing nephropathy cases, so not ACE inhibitor, angiotensin II receptor blocker, uh, uh, it's used quite frequently in people with fibrosis cirrhosis with good response. So for some of these refractory cases, I think we're going to probably start pulling that out more. But again, we don't have any great data right now to support that. So antibiotics. Uh, now, for, for my culture, or excuse me, for my biopsy dogs, I usually do. I do give IDEX that that uh, money. We let them culture the liver. Vast majority, vast vast majority are negative because again, we don't think the majority of these are active bacterial. Cholangio hepatitis, at least the ones that we, the ones we're concerned about, more chronic hepatitis. But I never think it's inappropriate. Metronidazole is all about ten dollars a course, to uh, with or without known. Well, obviously, if you have a positive culture, treat accordingly. But for these dogs where I biopsy them and I see that there's a suppurative component, the ba the pathologist will always say potential bacterial. That dog's going to get a month of flagell, most likely. And again, I don't think it's inappropriate at all for these ALT dogs. If owner's not ready or can't get your ultrasound done, to throw some metronidazole at them. With with your uh, hepatic support of choice, recheck them in a month to six weeks. So a lot of you that send liver cases to me and we don't see much on the ultrasound, they go out on metronidazole and uh, liver magic or sodiol. Recheck them in six weeks. And if the values improve, we, we've probably done something. Perhaps ascending bacterial cholangiohepatitis or the ursodiol has worked or we just were catching the, uh, the downturn in the release of the ALT. Uh, either way, I take credit for the success. What was that? Oh, the, the liver dose, 7.5 to 10 mg per kg BID. So, uh, or up, up to 15, but yeah, 7.5 to 10. So lower than what we've used for many years. But that's, that's also my diarrhea dose now too. So again, uh, when we talk about this cholangiohepatitis, hepatitis, we forget that, that the portal vein carries bacteria to the liver, but those cupfer cells, those macrophages, they're a potent first line of, or the line of defense against infection ascending to the liver. But with liver insufficiency, the cupfer cells, uh, the immune, local immune system can be affected and you can get these um, ascending cholangiohepatitis hepatitis cases. So never inappropriate, in my opinion, uh, it's obviously with positive culture treat them, but never inappropriate to do some flagell from a thermoxicillin, whichever uh, antibiotic you want. So liver supports, we all have these on our shelves from multiple studies, mostly not in dogs, uh, rats and people, etc. A lot of oxidative damage. We won't go through the pathophysiology of oxidative damage, free radicals, etc. But uh, most products, good news about this, they're all 
extremely safe. We just don't see dogs or cats really getting sick uh, on most of these. For those that uh, are financially restricted, send them to the pharmacy, get vitamin E. Uh, we probably should all be taking more vitamin E, I think, the more we read about it. 10 international units per kg comes usually in two and 400 uh, international unit doses just once a day. So uh, for dogs, people that, that love to give supplements, I say, well, you need more vitamin E because it's very safe, inexpensive, and uh, pretty pretty solid antioxidant for just a routine vitamin. Uh, SAMe, those of us who uh, remember when Denisil came out, uh, again, it's a powder protective, pretty good antioxidant. All the rage, those milk thistles, silymarin and silibin. Um, that's where denimarin comes in. It just packages these two. So if I'm going to pull a liver support off the shelf, uh, at least on the surface, uh, it's got everything you want. It's got some SAMe, got some milk thistle. You want to really be impressive, throw in some vitamin E, and you've got a pretty well, uh, pretty solid antioxidant protocol put together for that dog. So what about complications? And this is where hopefully a take-home, um, I don't think I have a summary slide, but if there's a take-home message with chronic hepatitis, those middle-aged dogs, especially the females, with an ALT elevation, pre-dental, pre-whatever, pre-mash removal, yearly lab work, if we're going to decide where we recommend to spend that client's money, when you do your seven, eight, nine-year-old dog yearly lab work, an ALT elevation, you add on your serum bio, or you recheck it and it stays up, those are the dogs we need to push forward. The, the little dachshunds with alkaline phosphatases of 1,000, you can push forward, but you're probably going to be okay to hang tight on those. those the little dogs with alkaline and maybe a mild ALT elevation that, that comes in and out of normal reference range. It's the, those breeds that are prone to chronic hepatitis. This is what we're wanting to prevent because we can't reverse that. And people can get a new liver for probably about $250,000. Uh, uh, charge to Obamacare. But uh, here, this is what we've got to avoid, these complications here. Because once these show up, in my experience, you're lucky to get six months, uh, Once, especially the ascites. And Rio has ascites. We talked about it. He still wants to move forward. We're, we're going to hope for the best. Any one of these, uh, that, that if they are present, either in, in the course of treatment or prior to or to time of or around the time of biopsy, you're not looking at a good outcome. Uh, Buzzy, the, the dog that we're, we chelated successfully, he's got an ALT around 150 now. I, I hope he has, he, I'm, I'm predicting he will have a pretty normal lifespan with his, with his reconstructed knees. We've since done two PLOs on him since we biopsied him. We caught him at the right time. Dr. Calfee made the right decision. Uh, I like to think, came to me, said I don't like this ALT. We, we biopsied, and again, a lot of money. This guy's got probably 15, 20,000 in Buzzy over the last couple of years or two. But uh, we, we caught Buzzy in time. Buzzy didn't have ascites. Buzzy had a high LT. Buzzy had a high fasting bile acid. We, we did. But, but if we didn't get to Buzzy, who knows, nine, ten months later, this could be Buzzy now. What do we do? We have this dog. I think we can all agree this, this dog from above has ascites. Uh, we use spironolactone in these dogs. Um, we know from human studies, uh, especially the alcoholic cirrhosis folks, that aldosterone levels are through the roof once you've developed this degree of, of uh, alcohol, uh, cirrhosis and ascites. And so spironolactone being an aldosterone inhibitor theoretically should work. I, I find all by itself it's not that effective. So I usually will add in furosemide. Uh, and of course some of these dogs need abdominocentesis. This dog right here is on comfortable not eating and probably having pretty significant diarrhea. I feel that there's water logging of the intestines with this volume of ascites and you're just not going to get this dog feeling well with just diuretics alone. You've got to get that dog tapped and, and probably still won't eat. Uh, sad. So paddock encephalopathy, uh, again, we think of that as primarily being an issue for our little shunt dogs after they've had a nice high-protein meal. Uh, we treat them the same, though, uh, but again, the paddock encephalopathy signs in our chronic hepatitis, middle-aged dogs, uh, if those signs are showing up, you're looking at a short, short time um, with that dog on this earth as a viable canine. Uh, so moderate prescription, uh, prescription liver diets, if you can get them to eat it, lactulose at standard doses, and antibiotics. So uh, with the goal of trying to reduce uh, uh, ammonia production in the large, in large bowel. So I usually, again, metronidazole, by far my, my favorite liver antibiotic. Uh, don't use neomycin much, but it's, it's always in the, in the papers uh, for hepatic encephalopathy. And then, of course, GI ulceration. Um, when, when these dogs start vomiting up coffee grounds, you're, you're again looking at short term uh, with that dog, but again, standard antacid therapy. So, uh, despite all this and, and, and concerns for when the prognosis is guarded, there are not really a lot of controlled studies. So, uh, I can't say that, that these treatments are going to, you know, they're not controlled because when you get these diagnoses, you, you're really not going to be in a lot of time to putting up placebo studies. But 
for chronic hepatitis, a couple of studies that get uh, frequently uh, quoted, uh, 6 to 16 months with therapy, dogs, and again, my time with Dr. Long with critical care, any, any disease process, the dogs that come in with a low albumin are going to do worse. And Rio, the lab, we biopsied last week's at 2.1. So, uh, as a, and I shared all this with the owner. Um, I, I, I think six months might be, might be uh, again, we'll see what the biopsy says, but six months might be optimistic, but we will see. Uh, but again, hypoalbuminemia, low, uh, all these indicators of decreased hepatic, excuse me, um, hepatic insufficiency uh, tend to give you a poor prognosis. And in a different study, dogs with cirrhosis, and I agree fully, less than one month when you get that degree of, of hepatocellular necrosis and, and, and hepatic collapse, a uh, month might, you, you'd be really good to, to make it a month. Uh, we biopsied a cocker about three or four months ago, survived eight days. So, um, very sad. But again, very dedicated owners wanted to do everything they could. Uh, but that dog went home and just would not eat, euthanized within eight days, and had very severe cirrhosis and ascites. So, uh, but other dogs, and these are the ones, uh, that's where I want Buzzy, the, the middle aged Labrador with the bionic knees now. That, those are numbers that we, can, that we, we want. You know, that's two to three years. So, if we can get that with these hepatitis dogs, things are very acceptable, especially for the eight, nine, ten year olds that, that have probably a 12 year old lifespan. Uh, any questions, happy to take them now. Otherwise, you all probably all know where to get me. Uh, and uh, happy to talk about hepatitis at all. If you want to talk about bile conjugation, Dr. Kelly Wong. Uh, it will be readily available to answer your question. She's not here, but we can get her back in. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>